welcome today's coverage, which is the second and final day of public discussion of the vicious meeting in June 19. Yes, good morning. The bishops have just begun their morning prayer on the second and final public day of public uh, of discussion at the vicious meeting in June 1989 at Seton Hall University. Uh, every morning the bishops open with a prayer. You can hear them in the background now. Yesterday, to bring you up to date, uh, yesterday the bishops discussed five subjects, and as we'll discuss them today, I'm Monsignor Eugene Clark, and I'm sharing this desk with Sister Angela Zukowski, and Father Robert Bono, and Father Patrick Branken will be on the floor interviewing bishops for your benefit to uh, enliven the discussion, and also to seek the bishops' individual perception of what they're discussing, uh, if we make it... Yes. Uh, we welcome Sister Angela. Angela, Sister Angela, would like to... Uh, Join me in this. We're going to discuss what the bishops did yesterday briefly, yes. and then you'll be able to tell the uh, listening audience what we're going to do today. Yes, and I think the summary will be very helpful to individuals who have not had a chance to uh, do the complete follow-up of yesterday's yes. session. Well, I know it just turned to Father Franken right now, who's got a camera on his interview station. Father Franken? Among many of the things that are still to be discussed today, evangelization among black Catholics and the implementation of the evangelization plan, an oral report on a proposed conference statement on AIDS and infectious diseases, and of course, votes have to yet to be taken on two of the significant action items. The first is the proposal for normalization of relationships between our country and the Republic of Vietnam, and that ran into some surprising discussion yesterday. And back to you now at the desk. Uh, now, we're now to the pastoral plan for black Catholics, supplementary document B. Bishop Ricard and the panel will lead our work today, and they will come, please, to the table. Work from here. Thank you. my brother bishops. As we get ourselves together, I join the other members of the Committee on Black Catholics in thanking you for the opportunity of sharing with you our insights into this area which you have entrusted to us as a committee of the conference. Over a year ago, the conference re realized that in order to adequately and completely address the needs of the church in this country, it was necessary to establish a standing committee on black Catholics, and a secretariat was op open to staff that committee. The purpose of the committee is to inform the conference of emerging trends and developments within the African -Amer American community as they affect the church. Through a continued process of critical analysis and dialogue, the committee seeks to identify those issues which impact the church both at the local diocesan level and at the national level. And when appropriate, we suggest to you concrete programs and procedures as we together seek to extend our ministry to blacks in America. In an attempt to be faithful to its mission, the committee has explored a variety of means of keeping the conference informed. After many hours of deliberation, we concluded that the a most effective way of doing this is to offer to you today an information session, which is our attempt to provide some catechesis on the status of the church in black America. This information session will include the following elements. A brief video, which has been developed by the staff of the committee. A panel of experts who will explore the issues from several perspectives, including that of evangelization, 
that of history and that of what it means to be black and Catholic. Following the panel discussion, we invite you to enter a dialogue with the panel and with us in exploring any issue which needs further clarification or to perhaps so share some of your own. By an introduction of the panel, the first person on our panel needs really no introduction. He's Archbishop Eugene A. Marino, formerly a Josephite priest, was born in Biloxi, Mississippi, ordained as a bishop in June of 1981, and appointed to the See of Atlanta as its first African-American archbishop, March 14, 1988. Before Archbishop Marino begins, I have to have an apology to the committee, at least to uh, you, the assembly today. Uh, due to an oversight, we discovered that uh, all of the panelists are from the state of Mississippi. That's all right. We're born in Mississippi. Something good does come out of Mississippi. <laughs> our, member of our, our panel, to many of you, needs no introduction. Sister Thea Bowman was born in Yazoo City, Mississippi, now lives in Canton, Mississippi, where she is the consultant for intercultural awareness of the Diocese of Jackson in Mississippi. She received her education at Catholic University, where she received the doctorate in the English language literature, uh, specializing in linguistics. Sister Thea also has the distinction of being one of the few persons to be featured in 60 Minutes who was not a subject of a criminal investigation, <laughs> we think. Without further ado, we welcome and... What does it mean to be black in the church and society? I want to tell you about the church. Heaven is my home, and I have here no lasting city. Cardinals, archbishops, bishops, my brothers. What church? Please help me to get home. 
What does it mean to be black in the United States? What does it mean to be African American? Our history includes the services of Simon of Cyrene, the search of the Ethiopian eunuch, the contributions of black Egypt in art and mathematics and monasticism and politics, the art and architecture of Zimbabwe, the scholarship of Timbuktu, the dignity and serenity of textile and gold and religion in Ghana the pervasive spirituality and vitality of Nigeria, the political and social systems of Zaire. Our history includes enslavement, oppression, and exploitation. As Malcolm X said, my folks, most of them didn't come over here on the Mayflower. They came over here on slave ships, in chains. Proud, strong men and women, artists, teachers, healers, warriors, and dream makers, inventors and builders, administrators like yourselves, politicians, priests, they came to these shores in the slave trade. Those who survived the indignity of the Middle Passage came to the American continent bringing treasures of African heritage, African spiritual and cultural gifts, wisdom, faith and faithfulness, art and drama. Here in an alien land, African people clung to African ways of thinking, of perceiving, of understanding values, of celebrating life, of walking and talking and healing and learning and singing and praying. You saw it on the film. African ways of laughing and being together and loving, that's culture. To the Americas, our people brought the secret memory of Africa, the celebration of life values in an African way and style, in song and instrumentation, in story and drum, in verse and anecdote, the memory of the survival mechanisms of Africa. The memory of color and texture, of culinary arts that translated even when we ate chitlins and other folks' as leftovers. African people here became African Americans, expressing faith in the God who loves and saves. They embodied and celebrated their own lives and their own values, their goals, their dreams, their relationships. Our history includes the island experience the Virgin Islands, Haiti, Cuba, our Hispanic experience in Central and South America, our native experience where African blood commingled with Choctaw and Chickasaw and Cherokee, with people of Asian and Asian Pacific origin, with Europeans from France and Germany. You wonder how come some of us look like we do? African people of the diaspora, we are here in this land, and this is our land. That's part of our history, too. Our people, black people, helped to build this nation in cotton and grain and beans and vegetables in brick and mortar. They cleared the land and cooked the food that they grew. They cleaned houses and built churches, some of them Catholic churches. They built railroads and bridges and national monuments. Black people defended this country as soldiers and sailors. Black people taught and molded and raised the children. And I'm not just talking about the black children. If you don't believe me, ask that cardinal sitting over there. Some more of y'all too, I imagine. You know what I'm talking about, church? I mean, are you walking with me, church? Surviving our history physically, mentally, emotionally, morally, spiritually, faithfully, and joyfully, our people developed a culture that was African and American, that was formed and enriched by all that we experienced. And uh, despite all this, despite the civil rights movement of the 60s and the socio-educational gains of the 70s, blacks in the 80s are still struggling, 
still scratching and clawing, as the old folks say, still trying to find home in the homeland and home in the church, still struggling to gain access to equal opportunity. A disproportionate number of black people are poor, poverty, deprivation, discrimination, stunt physical, intellectual, and spiritual growth. I don't need to tell you this, but I want to remind you, more than a third of the black people that live in the United States live in poverty, the kind of poverty that lacks basic necessity. I'm talking about old people who have worked hard all their lives and don't have money for adequate food or shelter or medical care. I'm talking about children who can never have equal access and equal opportunity because Poverty doomed them to low birth rate and retardation and unequal opportunity for education. More than 55% of black babies are born to single mothers. About 41% of black families are single parent families headed by women. The divorce rate for blacks is twice as high as for whites. Black children are twice as likely as white children to be born prematurely, to suffer from low birth rate, to live in substandard housing, to have no parent employed. Unemployment and underemployment among us are endemic, and many of us don't have the social and political context that put us where the jobs are when the jobs are being passed out. One of every 21 black males is murdered. A disproportionate number of our men are dying of suicide and AIDS and drug abuse and low self-esteem. What does it mean to be black and Catholic? For many of us, it means having been evangelized, having been educated, having been given a chance through the work of the Catholic Church, through the Josephites, or the Holy Wo Divine Word Fathers, or the Holy Ghost Fathers, or the Franciscans, or the Edmonites, or the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament. I'm from Mississippi. The first schools in Mississippi was started in the cathedral of the, the cathedral basement by a diocesan priest and a group of lay women. For so many of us, being black and Catholic means having come into the church because education opened the door to evangelization. It means in an age when black men and black women were systematically kept out of the priesthood and out of most religious communities, there were those who cared and who came and who worked with and for us and among us and helped us to help ourselves. And now our black American bishops in the name of the church universal have publicly declared that we as a people of faith, as a Catholic people of God, have come of age. And it is time for us to be evangelizers of ourselves. What does it mean to be black and Catholics? Catholic, it means that I come to my church fully functioning. That doesn't frighten you, do, does it? I come to my church fully functioning. I bring myself, my black self, all that I am, all that I have, all that I hope to become. I bring my whole history, my traditions, my experience, my culture, my African-American song and dance and gesture and movement and teaching and preaching and healing and responsibility as gift to the church. I bring a spirituality that our black American bishops told us, they just told us what everybody who knew knew, that spirituality is contemplative and biblical and holistic, bringing to religion a totality of mind and imagination, of memory, of feeling and passion and emotion and intensity 
a faith that is embodied incarnate praise, a spirituality that knows how to find joy even in the time of sorrow, that steps out on faith, that leans on the Lord, a spirituality that is communal, that tries to walk and talk and work and pray and play together. Even with the busy, you know, when our business around, we want to be where we can find them, where we can reach out and touch them, where we can talk to them. Don't be too busy, y'all. A spirituality that in the middle of your mass or in the middle of your sermon just might have to shout out and say, Amen, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. that attempts to be spirit-filled. The old lady said, if you love the Lord your God with your whole heart and your whole soul and your whole mind and all your strength, then you praise the Lord with your whole heart and soul and mind and strength and you don't bring him any feeble service. If you get enough fully functioning black church Catholics in your diocese, they gonna hold up the priest and they gonna hold up the bishop. We love our bishops, y'all. We love y'all, too. But see, these bishops are our own, ordained for the church universal, ordained for the service of God's people. But they ours. We raised them. They came for our community. And in a unique way, they can speak for us and to us. And that's what the church is talking about, indigenous leadership. The leaders are supposed to look like their folks. Ain't that what the church says? <laughs> to be black and Catholic means to realize that the work of the ordained ministers is not a threat to me, and I'm no threat to that. The work of the ordained minister, of the professional minister, is to enable the people of God to do the work of the church to feed us sacramentally, to enable us to preach and to teach. And I ain't necessarily talking about preaching in the pulpit. You know as well as I do that some of the best preaching does not go on in the pulpit. But as a Catholic Christian, I have a responsibility to preach and to teach, to worship and to praise. Black folk can't just come in the church and depend on the priest and say, let Father do it, and if Father don't do right, then they walk out and they complain, you know. That liturgy didn't do anything for me. The question that we raise is, what did you do for the liturgy? And the church is calling us to be participatory and to be involved. The church is calling us to feed and to clothe and to shelter and to teach and your job to enable me, to enable God's people, black people, white people, brown people, all the people to do the work of the church in the modern world. Teaching, preaching, witnessing, worshiping, serving, healing and reconciling in black because wedded to the lived experience, to the history and the heritage of black people. Getting in touch to be black and Catholic means to get in touch with the world church, with my brothers and sisters in Rome, with my brothers and sisters in China, with my brothers and sisters in Europe and Asia and Latin America, with the church of Africa. Do your folk realize that there are more Catholic Christians in Africa than in North America, and then they run around talking about the minority? <laughs> in Africa right now, 300 people become Christian every day, and 75% of them are becoming Roman Catholic. The Vatican Central Office reports that in Africa, the number of students for the priesthood increased by 88% between 1970 and 1988, while in North America, the number dropped by 43%. To be black and Catholic means to be intensely aware of the changing complexion of the College of Cardinals. I picked up your Catholic newspaper and I saw the picture church, world church. A lot of folks look like me. We got to get the word out. 
To be black and Catholic still, though, often feels like being a second or third class citizen of the holy city. You know, Bishop Jim Life said a long time ago that black Catholic Christians will be second class citizens of the church until they take their places in leadership beside their brothers and sisters of whatever race or national origin. Realizing that the documents Bishop Marino was talking about, brothers and sisters to us that you wrote, what we have seen and heard, have not been uniformly studied or implemented, integrated into life. Bishop Howe said one time the church has excellent documents, but nobody reads them. I mean, Bishop Howe's. They both from Mississippi. Sometimes I mix up the name. <laughs> yeah. The majority of priests, religious, and lay ministers who serve the black community in the United States still are not from the black community. And many of those people who attempt to serve among us, some of them perhaps in your diocese, do not feel an obligation to learn or understand black history or spirituality or culture or life, black tradition or ritual. They work for the people, but they have not learned to share life and love and laughter with the people. They somehow insulate themselves from the real lives of the people because they don't feel comfortable with black people. I travel all over the country and I see it. Black people within the church, black priests, sometimes even black bishops who are invisible. And when I say that, I mean they're not, they're not consulted. They are not included. Sometimes decisions are made that affect the black community for generations, and they are made in rooms by white people behind closed doors. Some of us are poor. Some of us have not had the advantages of education. But how can people still have a voice and a role in the work of the church? Isn't that what the church is calling us all to? I see people who are well-educated and experienced and willing to work. Sometimes they're religious, sometimes they're lay. They're not included in the initial stages of planning. They're not included in the decision-making. Now, I know you're a bishop, and I'm not talking about somebody coming into your diocese trying to tell you what, what to do. I'm talking about the normal church-authorized consultative processes that attempt to enable the people of God to be about the work of the Catholic Church. If you know what I'm talking about, say amen. amen. See, the church then, church, oh yeah! Y'all talk about what do you have to do if you want to be a multi multicultural church. Sometimes I do things your way, sometimes you do things mine. That's, <laughs> is that it? I'm Christian Marie Ramirez. Yeah. Black people who are still victims within the church of paternalism, of a patronizing attitude. Black people who within the church have developed a mission mentality. They don't feel called, they don't feel responsible, they don't do anything. You know, let father do it, let the sisters do it, let the friends and benefactors from outside do it. That's the mission mentality and it kills us and it kills our churches. And so within the church, how can we work together so that all of us have equal access to input, equal access to opportunity, equal access to participation? Go in the room and look around and see who's missing and send some of your folk out to call them in so that the church can be what she claims to be truly Catholic. They still talk about black folk in the church. You hear it, you know, you hear it over on the sideline. They say we lazy, they say we loud, they say we irresponsible, they say we lower the standards. So often we've been denied the opportunities to learn and to practice. You learn by trial and error, ain't that how you learn? And to grow. Some black people don't approve of black religious expression in Catholic liturgy. They've been told that it's not properly Catholic. They've been told that it's not appropriately serious or dignified or solemn or controlled, that the European way is necessarily the better way. 
How can we teach all the people what it means to be black and Catholic? The National Catechetical Director says that all catechesis is supposed to be multicultural, but how little of it is. When we attempt to bring our black gifts to the church, people who do not know us say we're being non-Catholic or separatist or just plain uncouth. I got to say one more thing. Y'all ain't going to like this, but that's all right. Catholic schools have been a primary instrument of evangelization within the black community. The church has repeatedly asked black folk, what do you want? What can the church do for you? And black folk all over the country are saying, help us to education. We need education. The way out of poverty is through education. The, the uh, opportunity, we can't be church without education because ignorance cripples us and kills us. Black people are still asking the Catholic church for Education. Now, some, sometimes we don't have the money. Are we finding alternative ways to speak to the black community in a language that they understand? Bishop Brunini said a lot of Catholics spend time ministering to the saved and go out there and work with the church folks. A lot of black people out there are unchurched. We have come a long way in faith. Just look where we have come from. We as black people find ourselves at the threshold of a new age. And as I look about the room, I know that many of you have walked and talked and worked and prayed and stood with us in society and in the church, and in the name of all black folk. I thank you. Today we're called to walk together in a new way toward that land of promise, and to celebrate who we are and whose we are. If we as church walk together, don't let nobody separate you. That's one thing black folk can teach you. Don't let folk divide you or, you know, put the lay folk over here and the clergy over here. Put the bishops in one room and the clergy in the other room. Put the women over here and the men over here. The church teaches us that the church is a family. It's a family of families, and the family got to stay together. And we know that if we do stay together, come here, brother. We know that if we do stay together, if we walk and talk and work and play and stand together in Jesus' name, we'll be who we say we are, truly Catholic, and we shall overcome. Overcome the poverty, overcome the loneliness, overcome the alienation, and build together a holy city, a new Jerusalem a city set apart where they'll know we are his because we love one another. We shall overcome. Y'all get up. We shall overcome. We shall You got to move together to do that. <laughs> you got to move together to do that. All right, now, walk with me. See, in the old days, you had to tighten up so that when the bullets would come, so that when the tear gas would come, so that when the dogs would come, 
so that when the horses would come, so that when the tanks would come, brothers and sisters would not be separated from one another. And you remember what they did with the clergy and the bishops in those old days, where they put them? Right up in front. <laughs> to lead the people in solidarity with our brothers and sisters in the church who suffer in South Africa, who suffer in Poland, who suffer in Ireland, who suffer in Nicaragua, in Guatemala, in, in Northern Ireland, all over this world. We shall live in love. We shall live in and aunts and sisters and friends, all the women who have brought you to priesthood, who have nurtured you toward episcopacy, who have strengthened you in faith and hope and love so that you can be Church of Jesus Christ, I accept these beautiful roses. God bless you always. Thank you so very much, Sister Thea. Thank you for the opportunity. Sister Thea has been called a national treasure. <laughs> I think that's been affirmed today. If I could find our chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh